Today, I'm going to convince you that we should be using a second circuit with a double lumen tube when doing thoracic surgery. The first advantage is that it allows us to continually monitor for minor double lumen tube malpositions from the time of initial placement until the end of surgery. Detecting minor double lumen tube malposition will allow early correction when it is easy to do so. If we lose lung isolation, most of the time it's a nuisance and a waste of time. However, at critical moments, injury, potentially severe, can occur. A second advantage is that we will have more effective deflation of the operative lung. We will be able to deliver 100% oxygen to that lung through our reservoir in our circuit while the patient is on one lung prior to chest entry. The third advantage is perhaps the most intuitive. We will have better control of lung reinflation when it comes time for testing for leaks or recruitment. There will be no need to adjust ventilator setting, moving a clamp. We will not have to look backward for the adjustable pressure limiting valve or our pressure manometer with our circuit. It's just simply far more elegant and simpler and probably safer. To build our circuit, we start with a highly compliant manual of ventilation bag either one or two liters, in which we have cut a hole in the distal tip. We place a clamp over the hole in the distal tip when we want to close the circuit for monitoring or remove the clamp from the hole in the tip when we want to use the circuit to ventilate or test the lung. We, we use a standard ventilator filter to allow us to connect our circuit to the double lumen tube. We attach the corrugated hosing and the oxygen tubing to the ventilator filter the oxygen tubing goes into the sampling port. The corrugated hosing will serve as an oxygen reservoir and as well as allow us to place the bag where it is most easily accessible during the case. If we desire a pressure manometer in the circuit, for example, when the surgeon is requesting pressures higher than 20 centimeters of water to test the lung, we can quickly attach this disposable pressure manometer. It is used in the ICU to measure endotracheal cuff pressure. Our manual ventilation bag resides for most of the case on the anesthesia ventilator table where it can be easily visualized. In this picture here, we see the circuit in monitoring mode. The snap is on the bag, and importantly, the oxygen tubing is not connected to the oxygen flow meter. This is a safe practice. The circuit with the snap on the bag is completely closed. If the tubing was connected to the flow meter and was inadvertently opened, excessive pressures could develop within the circuit. This is the circuit shown in its entirety, uh, the manual ventilation bag is sitting on the table where we can most easily visualize it throughout the case. After perfect position the double lumen tube with a flexible bronchoscope, the double lumen tube can still move outward the path of least resistance. Some of the reasons are listed here. Importantly, too much air in the bronchial cuff can cause an outward avulsion of the double lumen tube. It is important to recognize that patients of short stature with short left main stem bronchus where the double lumen tube cannot be placed as deeply are at higher risk for loss of lung isolation during surgery. We start with a minimal amount of air in the bronchial cuff to create a seal. If the cuff begins to move into the larger space of the crina, it will expand in volume. As a consequence, the pressure within the cuff will decrease. Also, at the same time, the surface area in contact with the bronchus will decrease. This will result in a leak around the cuff. This is the basis of how we detect for minor double lumen tube malposition. If no air is required in the bronchial cuff to make an effective seal, our double lumen tube is too large and our technique of monitoring double lumen tube position will not work. If only the correct amount of air has been placed into the bronchial cuff, as the double lumen tube begins to migrate outward, the bronchial cuff will herniate into the larger carina. A leak will develop around the cuff. Air under positive pressure from the ventilator will go around the cuff and exit the path of least resistance out the lumen of the double lumen tube to the operative lung. It will not affect the lung on the side of surgery. 
In contrast, with our technique, the leaked gas would begin to accumulate in our collection bag. This provides us a cue to reposition the double lumen tube inward. By early detection, we prevent complete loss of lung isolation. We don't want to end up in the situation where the distal tip is completely in the trachea. It may be very difficult to reposition and injury can occur if this happens at critical moments during the surgery. Now I'm going to show you how much air, I'm going to show myself creating a leak and this is how we determine how much air to put into the distal cup. I'm going to withdraw air slowly. Make sure I'm ventilating here. I'm going to withdraw air. And there you see the bag begins to inflate. There it stops inflating. So it's a minimum amount of air in that distal cuff. We now what I'm going to do is I'm going to gradually pull back on the tube until I create a leak again. There, we see now we got air accumulation there. We stopped. So now we can see I just created a herniation in the cuff. So this is a very useful monitor when we're positioning the patient to the ladder of the cubitus. We start one lung ventilation from a the time of initial placement of the double lumen tube in the supine position. We have the patient on one lung ventilation while transitioning. We are monitoring for position of the double lumen tube during positioning. We don't have to overflex the head. If I see that bag begin to inflate, I would be very simple for me to just push it inward. I'm very confident that after this movement, when I go back down with the flexible bronchoscope, that double lumen tube position would be very close to what it was when I started. There is no risk of having low oxygen saturations with movement or being on the one, one lung ventilation. The chest has not been opened yet. We have 100% oxygen in the cor corrugated tubing. And also, if we need, we can manually ventilate. That when bronchial blockers have been compared with double lumen tubes for promoting effective deflation of the lung on chest entry, the bronchial blockers seem to be at least equal and perhaps superior in this regards. With the traditional technique, on going to one lung ventilation using the double lumen tube, the anesthesiologist will open the lumen to the operative lung to 21% oxygen. The surgeon will ask us to start one lung ventilation four to 10 minutes prior to chest entry. Due to the effects of indirect ventilation from pressures transmitted from the ventilated lung, over time, the oxygen concentration in the surgical lung will approach 21%, even if we started initially with 100% oxygen in the circuit. In contrast, with our circuit, we have 100% oxygen in the reservoir, which we are ventilating indirectly prior to chest entry. Oxygen trapped in alveoli below closing volume will be absorbed by mixed venous blood until the oxygen volume percent within the alveolus is that of mixed venous blood or about 15 volumes percent. After this, there will be an effective right to left shunt from blood flowing across those alveoli. In this bar graph, the x-axis represents time, the y-axis volume. On the left, we represent alveoli where air is trapped with starting with 35 percent oxygen. Over time, Oxygen will be reabsorbed by the mixed venous blood until the concentration of oxygen in the alveolus is 15%. At that point, there is an effective right-to-left shunt. On the right side of the bar graph, we represent alveoli with 100% oxygen. As the mixed venous blood absorbs oxygen from the alveolus, the oxygen concentration within the alveolus will remain high. This is why we believe we have more effective deflation with our technique, and also why we see fewer significant oxygen desaturations following opening the chest and collapse of the lung. In the following clip, we will see indirect ventilation by observing the bag as it inflates and then deflates. The patient is on one lung ventilation. The chest has not been entered. This indirect ventilation is occurring with 100% oxygen in our circuit.
As we watch this, bear in mind that the dead space in the double lumen tube is quite small. Our circuit has two mo modes of operation. When we're monitoring, we have the snap over the hole in the bag. We do not connect the oxygen tubing to the auxiliary flow meter. The amount, small amount of leak from not connecting the oxygen tubing to the oxygen flow meter will not impair our ability to detect early outward migration of the double lumen tube. When we want to use the circuit as a means of ventilating or testing the lung, we first remove the snap on the hole in the bag, then we attach our oxygen tubing to the auxiliary flow meter. Pressure will be controlled in the bag by pinching off the hole between our thumb and index finger. In this scenario, I'm going to explain how we use the circuit differently when we're monitoring and when we're ventilating or testing the lung with the circuit. When monitoring the patient, I do not connect the oxygen tubing to the oxygen flow meter. The small amount of leak that this will create in the circuit will not interfere with our ability to detect leaks from outward migration. We, it's better to have a small leak. I don't connect it to the oxygen tubing because sooner or later, it hasn't happened yet, someone is going to inadvertently turn the oxygen flow to on with the circuit completely closed and end up with higher pressures than intended in the lung. So the first thing I do in this scenario, I've been monitoring the patient, the bag is on the table. We would probably see this bag moving up and down, not in the simulation, of course. So the first thing I'm going to do for example, uh, I want to increase the oxygen saturations and flush the remaining nitrogen of the lung. I will remove the snap. That's the first thing. The second thing I do is I connect the oxygen tubing. It's safe now to connect the oxygen tube. Third thing, I hold the bag and turn the oxygen flow up. In this case, I'm turning it up higher than I normally would uh, because I've got uh, because of the, the, the scenario. But normally I would turn that up one, two meters. I pinch off the hole in the bag. So whether I'm ventilating or testing the lung, this allows me to face the surgical field. When ventilating the lung, I'm monitoring the pressures. Oxygen is being flushed through our, out of the, uh, nitrogen is being flushed out of, the, out of our lung and our reservoir is being filled with oxygen. When it comes time to testing the lung, I simply hold the bag, watch my monitor, and squeeze gently as the watch as the pressures increase. With this technique, I can be looking over the surgical field or at the video screen to watch the lung. If the surgeon says suddenly says, whoa, that's too much pressure, all I have to do is release that. The pressure will go instantly back to zero. So this is much safer. So once again, I just want to reiterate this key point is oxygen tubing is off when the clamp is on the bag. When the clamp is on the bag, we're monitoring. When we're ventilating or inflating the lung for testing, we first remove the clamp or the snap on the hole in the bag, then connect the tubing, then turn on the oxygen flow. Thank you. If you have any questions or suggestions for improvements on this presentation, please contact me and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Much appreciated. Thank you.